So I have with me Professor Liz Henry, and um, he has created, along with his colleagues from the University of West London, an MA in Global Black Studies, Decolonization and Social Justice. And he's here to tell us more about it. Welcome. Okay, so I'm going to allow you to start. Tell me how it came about and what it exactly is entailed. Right, so um, greetings, Sis Bev and, uh, and the family, and greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Professor William Les Henry, also known as Les the Lyrics, original Mike Mandan, just in case you don't know. And the idea, for, the idea has actually been floating around in my head for probably over two decades. And the reason why I say that is because, and I know I discussed this and it was represented in your wonderful Butterfly magazine last year or the year before I lose track of time. But I didn't have a great experience at school. I got expelled from school at 15, no qualifications. I got expelled from college at 16. No qualifications, my twin brother didn't, so I have to kind of own that. But more importantly, I was kind of like rescued stroke salvaged by Moonshot Youth Club doing black studies from 1972. So I've always had an interest in, you know, like the countercultures of the African diaspora from our perspective. So the idea is, you know, it's always resonated with me because you know, that's what introduced me to myself as an African, person of African ancestry. And it's always sustained me throughout my, my I don't know, people say I'm self-educated. I don't know what that means. I don't really believe that. You know, we're products of our environment. But what I will say is, you know, whilst that for most of my life before this academic life, I was a tradesman, so plumbing, central heating, industrial pipe fitting. So I always had disposable income and I always used to buy books. I used to live in my local libraries between Forest Hill, um, Crofton Park, and uh, where is it? Forest Hill, Crofton Park, and Lewisham Library. Just give me one sec, because I, you just heard that, didn't you? That's an email coming in, so I'm going to shut that off. Right. So as I said, you know, didn't really do that great at school, but I've always been interested in, in not just African history and so-called black history. I've been interested, I'm always interested in world history, global history, because from when I was at school, I refused to accept that only white people were the doers and shakers. And in fact, when I got expelled from school, it was because I started to learn black history, black studies at Moonshot. So at school, they're telling us all the ancient Egyptians and all that. We're seeing Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton on TV, Anthony Cleopatra, all that, blah, blah. And then these people are introducing us to people who look like us, <laughs> right. pharaohs who look like us, you know, kings and queens literally who look like us. And not just from ancient Egypt, from across Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, you know, so-called, you know, West Africa you know, Nigeria, Ghana, kingdoms of Mali, Songhai, we were just getting exposed. So obviously I'm going into school and when my teachers are talking one thing, I'm saying to them, but you know, hold on a second, cause you know, but it's really interesting because I have sympathy for them. Although a lot of our teachers were racist and at that moment it was to control. And it wasn't just to control black children, it was to control white children is a very class-based dynamic and a lot of our teachers were ex-army you know we're talking 20 years after the war i went to school or wherever it was so you know in fact we're 20 45 55 so yeah you know i started school in 1962 so we're only talking 17 years after the war so a lot of our teachers were ex-army they were there to control and obviously a lot of them were bastions and supporters of the British Empire. So when you're bringing these counter knowledges to them and saying, but I, I just used to say this fundamental thing to my teachers. 
from when I was about 11, I used to say, are you telling me I'm the only black person who can think? And it used to bother me. So I've always been interested in, in what we do, what we bring to the table. And before I even knew what a degree was in sociology or anthropology, you know, I was Leslie Lurks on Sound System as an educator spreading black history. So, you know, if people are familiar with me from 1982, when I first started chatting on Saxon, then Gettertone, then Diamonds, then, no, then Frontline, then Diamonds, you know, people will know that 90% of what I chat is exactly the same as what I write about today. And in fact, I found an old track of mine called The Time, which I did with the wonderful producer, Simon Harris, when I was with Musical Life Living Beat Records. And I found a video yesterday and shared it on Twitter and things like that. And some of the comments that came back were, you've always been conscious, Les. And, you know, this was from 1990. It was something I did on Channel 4 with this sister called Cheryl, who was who sang with me at the time, who was my little sister, June, peace be upon her, as best friend. And, you know, I was looking at this performance and I, I don't really like to revisit a lot of what I've done, produced, written. And it's not out of some kind of whatever it is. I just, it, in fact, Chinua Chebi, our wonderful ancestor, he summed it up because he said an aspect of Igbo culture is you don't just claim everything because there are no self-generated people I put on it. We're products of what we know. So what we produce is based on what we've been taught, what we've been encouraged, etc. So to me, when I've done that piece of work, it done, make me move on. <laughs> and it's not like a false modesty, it's literally that. But I, re I remember this track yesterday and people were feeding it back to me. So I actually watched it, all of it. And I thought to myself, I've never changed. Which is why oftentimes when I, when I have these kind of conversations, I talk about my degree self and my pre-degree self right. because there are similarities there. There are parallels there. My, my thinking, my pride and my indomitable spirit as an African person has just moved from my lyricism into what I write as an academic. So one of the crucial differences about this MA is going to be the fact that we Myself and you, and those of us in the UK, are going to be prominent and we're going to be visible. And what I mean by that is no disrespect to my African-American brothers and sisters, but there's a collapsing and a conflation of black history as African-American history. And most people know that. You go into schools in the UK during Black History Month, it's, predom it's dominated by African-American representation, iconography, blah, blah, blah. To me, there's nothing wrong with that, it's fine. But we also have a story that needs to be not just told, but to create a more inclusive black studies, which is why we've called ours global black studies. So people who, who do the course, do the masters, and it's not just a masters that you can do full-time and part-time, it's also got continuous professional development in it which is one of the reasons why I was adamant, despite some of the stuff that's been going on, you can just imagine. This course is global black studies, decolonization and social justice. Because to me, those are the three crucial parts about what as peoples of African ancestry, we need to strive for. And I'm not talking about pandering to anyone for acceptance or begging anyone for crumbs off their table. This is our table. So we'll feast on what we feel like on it. One of the points you you raised there, which I have down here, is the action. Is, when you spoke about African American, but I've also noticed um, in my studies that the Caribbean kind of gets left out. We're always at the bottom of absolutely. Um, and even now, from my perspective in media. Again, Africa is right here. the Caribbean, and if anything is happening, we're not hearing about it. Absolutely. And we're going to redress that imbalance, because the point that I'm making is, you know, 
we know that, for instance, now there are more brothers and sisters from the African continent than there are from the African Caribbean community. We know that. Yeah. And that has happened since probably late 80s, 90s, whatever. Fine. However, one of my major concerns with the collapsing into the African-American experience is the brothers and sisters from the continent are invisible, which is important. Mm -hmm. However, our stories, in some ways, are central to the African-American experience. So I'll give you a, a couple of examples. When Maleficetti Asante put out his book, Afrocentricity, which is a good book, when I read it, I thought, I'm not in there. We're invisible. So, and as I said, this was me, my pre-degree self. This is Leslie Lyrics, you know, writing, researching, reading, whatever. But it really bothered me. Now, one of the main reasons why it bothered me is the fact that we know that African chattel enslavement, which is what we will call it on this course, the only time you're going to read about something called slavery is when you're reading it in a book. But we, our critical point of engagement is African chattel enslavement, because that is what Europeans did to us. It was not slavery. Because in slavery, there are many ways to barter your way out of it. And I'm not saying it isn't a system of human degradation, etc. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is what happened to us was qualitatively different. And those of us from the Caribbean, in my humble opinion, and I've written about this and argued it, are 100% a part of the African-American experience. I'll give you some examples very quickly. First one, we know that Queen Elizabeth I institutionalized chattel enslavement. The system that we were subjected to, it was her and the British. We know the other Europeans were doing whatever they were doing. She institutionalized it. They're the ones who colonized the Americas, in America, let's say. Their brothers and sisters, whether they were the, the disenfranchised, disaffected scum of the British streets, doesn't matter. Just like what happened in Australia and other places. Right. Now, why this becomes crucial is, once the people here cottoned on to the, the amount of money and financial wealth they could accrue, they not only invested in plantations in America, they invested in plantations in the Caribbean. And one of the things that we know is, the, the reason why you'll have people in America called Henry, and you'll have people in Jamaica called Henry, and people in Barbados called Henry, and Trinidad and, and Grenada and everywhere, is because oftentimes they were owned by the same families. Yes. And the other thing what used to happen is, let's say, you were a plantation owner in Virginia and something happened and let's say you had a hundred enslaved Africans and 30 of them just dead, so, 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 and you need another 30. The first person you're gonna to go to is your family member or you're gonna to go to your estates in the Caribbean to get them shipped over and vice versa. That for me has been a leader and is, is pretty invisible. The second and most crucial thing is take away Garvey, the obvious representation. Look at Malcolm X, Grenada mother. Look at Langston Hughes. Look at CLR James. Look at all of these people who were crucial to the, those systems of thought, yet oftentimes they're not in there. And we haven't even started to speak about Claudia Jones, Sylvia Winter, and all these wonderful peoples from the Caribbean you know, um, Eric Williams, Walter Rodney. We haven't even started to think about them. Irish Bishop. And then if we shift over to the continent now, where are people like Chinwezu, or even my mentor, peace be upon him, Herbert Ekwe Ekwe? Where is Miriam Abar? Where are all these people who we can use? Bessie Head from South Africa, who wrote about being maddened by that apartheid system, yet, if you take it out of the context of the, of, of the African experience on the continent, you will see it here, you'll see it in the Americas, you'll see it in Brazil, you'll see it wherever we are on this planet. You'll see the same thing with our ab Aboriginal brothers and sisters in Australia. You'll see it with the First Nations peoples 
in the Americas. And the reason why I know this for a fact is because these are the people I've been conversating with for years. And the similarities are that oftentimes they know the only way they can tune in to a universal voice that actually represents what they're doing is under the context of global black studies. I was just going to say. So and reggae that. music does that. You think about reggae, there is no place on this planet you can go, you won't hear reggae, nowhere. You can go to places on this planet now and ask them if they've heard of Madonna or Puff Daddy or 50 Cent. They ain't got a clue you're talking about. So you say reggae music, Bob Marley, then we'll sing our tune. Yep. And to me, that's what we're going to do. And also, we're going to look at the indentureship especially in places like Trinidad and Tobago and some of the other islands, because there's that very interesting relationship there where our brothers and sisters from Asia came over to be indentured. And many people don't know why they, why they ended up there, why they were trapped there. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, and this is one of the things what, so one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Trisha Tikasing, who is Trini, one of the things she's going to look at is that whole notion of indentureship and what Torah Bully calls coolitude. Because remember, negritude was created, Amy Cezanne, people like that. Well, this brother came up with coolitude because what he's basically looking at is that really interesting relationship because we know when we come from the Caribbean, okay, like let's say, so you're from Barbados. Yeah, well, I'm from Jamaica, that's my parentage, okay? We know that many of the so-called coolies, Indians, are black. In fact, they're blacker than loads of the people of African ancestry. Look at Supercat, the yeah. DJ. Yeah. Now, the point is we have these kinds of really interesting mixings that are not often represented and they're not acknowledged because people create this dichotomy that you've got black and you've got, Af say in Trinidad, you've got African, you've got black. What about who I've been told are the Douglas and people like that then? Well, also, don't you find that even people who start to categorize people? So that, what you're talking about there, I mean, my family's from Jamaica, but um, I hear them talking and they sort of talk about two things they talk about. One is small island people, the other is coolies. Yeah. So there's this division. Absolutely. We are, we, and you said earlier, we are what we've been taught. We've heard it and we just carry it on. Absolutely. And it's interesting that, you you know, you say Jamaica, sorry, I don't know where I got Barbados from, but it's interesting. Because of, because of Eloy. Oh, yeah, of course, that makes logical sense. Right. But for me, it's really interesting because this is the this is the salient point for me. We can have those conversations in the Caribbean and we can, you know, for instance, I've said it on record loads of times. My father would have beat us if we'd spoken about Big Island and Small Island. He just never had that mentality. He was one of those so-called swallow migrants who used to go to the States or wherever, you know, as a farmer and go back to Jamaica. In fact, if it wasn't for the, this thing called the McCarran Water Act, many of us wouldn't have been here. It's when America stopped something like usually annually they would get something like 250,000 people from the Caribbean as swallow migrants. The majority of them were coming from places like Jamaica and what they basically did was they cut that after the second world war and that is why a lot of us ended up here. That's why when I do my talks on Windrush I factor that in. In fact you know where I take it right back to Sam Sharp the, the um, Paul Bogle rebellion and Sham Sharp. That's why I bring it back to, because people need to understand and the role of Haiti in that as well. So it wasn't, it wasn't coincidental that our parents ended up here with the five-year myth of return, which is exactly the same as what happened to our brothers and sisters from India and that continent because people didn't want to stay here. Many of them knew this was a scornful mother country. So why would you want to invest your time in it? And these conversations we're having now 
of what we're going to have on this degree. So we're going to look at the role of indentureship because, for instance, here's an example, okay. When you look at the political system now, so Hancock got dismissed. Who do they put in his place? Another Asian. There are no black members of the senior cabinet, to my knowledge. In fact, there might be one now. Um, the business, business. Yeah, I think he's been recently recruited yeah. in here yeah. over the last six months or something. Well, so let's say there's one, let's be generous. There's one and a piece then. Yeah. My point is this. When you see this Sajid Javid, mm -hmm. oh, that's his name, yeah. yeah. When you see him, what's the other one? Ricky Shunak, what is it? Shuna. Him yeah. and Priti Patel. It is not coincidental that they're all Asians. Exactly. Because they were the buffer in the Caribbean. However, when the Indians indentured came to places in the Caribbean, just like when we came to the UK unmasked, because we know Africans have been here for thousands of years. I don't want to walk down that today. When we came here, the working class had a class below them. It didn't matter whether we were bus drivers or mathematicians. That is what happened when a lot of the Indians went to the Caribbean. So as Africans, a lot of us looked and said, wow, there are people in even worse condition than we. But something happened and that status changed. And what that status, what that did was it became representative of the British Empire. You had white at the top. Underneath white, you would have maybe the Raj, Indians, yeah. Chinese, whoever else. Mm -hmm. At the bottom was us. Okay. And they use Asians as buffers not just gatekeepers but buffers okay and that was explained to me wonderfully by my my late mentor prof herbert Ekweque, when he actually said to me when he was a student in nigeria okay we well, didn't call it nigeria he's Igbo, and he was in that part of the world okay west africa he said to me there were two things he wanted to experience when he left and one of them was he wanted to meet someone from Barbados. Because Barbados was Little England. Oh. Barbados was where you sent your children to, to get that kind of education. You could send them to Eton or you could send them to Barbados. They had exactly the same standing. So oftentimes it was brothers and sisters from Barbados, mostly brothers, who were parachuted into African countries as the buffer. And that that um, that uh, title still sticks today. Of course, it does. Listen, you know, I must admit, when we went to Barbados three years ago, mm. post Black Panther, mm -hmm. I think the Black Panther movie did something to them, and people have said that. Like Brother Tony Warner, who does um, yeah. Black History Walks, he basically suggested it conscientized a lot of them. Because apparently all the all the kente cloth, all the ashake cloth, whatever was sold out. People were dressing up, and it's almost like because when we went there, let me tell you, I've been to Barbados a few times on holiday and in transit, and I used to dread going there because it really reminded me of when I'm in Jamaica in the north coast, and no, you go into no. a shop, and if a white person walks in, they serve them in front of you. That's, That's right. what Barbados reminded me of. But when I went back three years ago, it's like they were completely different. But it is that legacy of colonialism and imperialism. Yeah. But it that is, is the power of the media, isn't it? You know, absolutely. That, that, that film in the way that it came across, you know, it really did something and sort of made us think, okay. Yeah, because, you know, I know a lot of people critiqued it, but, I, you know, most people know me. I'm sci-fi. I'm a sci-fi nut. I have thousands of original Marvel comics here, thousands. Been connecting them from when I was a youth. Then my eldest son, who's in his 40s, he started collecting them so I could read them without having to buy them. But I've always been into that. I've got original copies of the Black Panther. 
thing. I remember when it came out in the 60s, 65 or 64. I remember when it came out. And what I'm basically saying is for me, take everything away from it. You saw black people, people of African ancestry, the good, the bad, the ugly and the indifferent. So for instance, you will always hear them say African Caribbean children, um, African Caribbean children don't aspire to blah, blah, blah. And they will compare us with our brothers and sisters from the continent. But the difference is, and, and I remember having these discussions with Prof Equa Equa in 1984. He said to me, if these are people who are coming from, let's say Nigeria, okay, they could be living in a council flat driving a bus, they've probably got a degree. So their children will always aspire to that as a minimum. Standard, exactly. Which is why if you're in, if you're in Jamaica, you know, why is it that loads of the people from Jamaica, and I've said this and I will challenge anyone, you get me children of a similar class, caste and level mm. from the UK and Jamaica, black, white, Chinese, I don't care who they are, mm. and put them together and the Jamaican children will probably smash them off the table. You know why? Because they see everything. They see judges who look like them, lawyers who look like them, teeth who look like them, igloos who look like them. We don't get that representation here. That's right. And that, therein lies the crux of the problem. That Absolutely. The crux of the problem. Also, yeah. um, somebody who was on the cover the other day, she, he, um, McConnell, and Colfer, and he was in the Gambia. Yeah. One of the things that he noticed, he, the people in the Gambia could not understand or relate to people who want to go over to the Gambia as the motherland and wanting to settle there. Yeah. He asked the question, he said, if a Chinese person comes over to the Gambia, what do you call them, Chinese? If an Asian person comes over, what do you call yeah. them, Asian? All right, so if a European person, white, goes over, they're European. So if I come over as a black person, why am I, not why am I yeah. still classed as yeah. a Western person? Yeah. Am I not an African? Yeah, you absolutely. But, and, that's, the, but sis, that's the game, isn't it? Yeah. That's the smoke and mirrors game that they've done. And so eff effectively, Absolutely. You know, effective. And and so, you know, he said now you go back to the education, because the education they have there, as we do in the Caribbean, is from the British. System. Of course it is. And so we are still, again your point, teaching what we know or yeah. rehearsing what it's, we it's divide and rule. When we went to the Gambia, we had the same kind of experiences. Okay. And and you see, to me, it's no different. And I've always kind of used this as an example. If I go to Jamaica today, and I go to Clarendon, where my people come from, and in, where my people come from in Clarendon, there is really no mixing up there. Them just black. The way they've been for the last probably 200 years. Okay. So all shades of black, from red black to blue black. But they're black. Now, if I go to them and I say to them, I'm going to have a dance, mm -hmm. black people only, they'll all come. Yeah. If I say I'm going to have a dance, African people only, half will come. Because they still have this distorted notion about Africa and they're not Africans. One of my cousins, I love her to death. She's in her 50s. Mm -hmm. I, I met her when I went to Jamaica in in 1986 mm -hmm. and she was 15 and she's like my cousin my little sister whatever and she came here um and i'm always saying to her because remember for a lot of jamaicans it's abstract when we mention africans yes very. because unless they go around kingston town center or ue if them steer country and that, they're not really going to meet a lot of brothers and sisters from the continent unless people bring them over and then oftentimes when they meet them they're shocked but anyway, so my cousin, when she came to England, I took her 
to macro, you know, the big supermarkets. Yes, 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 right? yes. So we went in there. And when we were in there, I started playing little games with her. So I see brothers and sisters. And I said to her, where do you think those people come from? And she said, they're my Jamaican man. And I say, where do you think those people, they're my Jamaican. Oh. You know, start asking me foolishness. And I went, well, I think they're Nigerians. Right. And those ones, I don't know, they sound a bit Frenchy. Maybe they're from Cote d'Ivoire or something like that. And she was shocked. Right. Because everybody, you're black, you must be a Jamaican. Yes. Would but you? if she's in Jamaica, she would look at Africans on the TV, not so much now, but let's say 20 years ago, she would say, Ms. not an African. She would say they don't look like her, whatever. Because that's how we've been programmed and conditioned. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's deliberate. It's deliberate divide and rule, divide and conquer tactics, because that is what they put in place. And as I said, you know, once we understand the commonality of our condition, as members of the human family, first, all the race stuff goes out the window and then everything else will follow it. Yeah. Because, you know, for instance, a beautiful thing happened yesterday, okay? England won. Now, I'll be honest with you. I am still of the generation where I, in fact, I'm less hostile now because now I don't really business. But before, I was vehemently anti-England winning anything. I didn't care if the Germans beat them. I just didn't, because of the way they treated me. As long as somebody beat them. Yeah, as long as somebody beat them. Okay. Now I'm kind of, because I suppose of loads of the black players and whatever. Okay. Now, what really was interesting was somebody tweeted me something today. <clears throat> no, somebody sent me an image and I tweeted it. And basically, 12 mainstream newspaper headline, front pages. Raheem Sterling was on one. Harry Kane was on nearly all of them. Harry Kane, Prince William, Niam Dan, Pick Niam and Wife. And that is what they don't get. That for me, and these are that's why on this Masters. We're going to look at all genres of representation. Right. So from written stuff, spoken word, to fine art, whatever, whatever people want to bring to the table for their dissertation, they're going to be able to do it. And the other thing that I'm going to argue for is, let's say you're a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And for your dissertation, you want to make a short film. Well, instead of doing, say, 15,000 words, you might do a short film and 3,000 words. Because to me, it's going to be, because one of the reasons why I wanted it to be a master's, and there was this wonderful sister called Professor Marcia Worrell, peace be upon her. She died suddenly about just over a year ago. And it was myself and her who were gonna do this degree. Cause it was my idea. And when, before I joined the school I'm now, School of Human and Social Sciences, this is my third year in there, I think. I was going to, um, I was running it by people in the law school when I was in the School of Law and Criminology, but it didn't really fit. But as soon as I got moved to this school or the criminology team moved, I thought, this is it. So the first person I approached was Marcia. And Marcia was like, yeah, great, let's do it. Cause she's from the Caribbean. I'm not sure what island she came from, but she understood what I wanted. And I said to her, global black studies, decolonization and social justice, that means if you're a practitioner, you should be able to do the masters. You may not have, you may have been like me, or have been out of education for whatever years. And this is why one of the, one of the, the or the way we're going to accept students, we don't just want people from a conventional background. They did a degree and blah, blah, blah. We will take in people with practical experience because I know so many people in the community who were just like me, didn't know what a degree was, but you telling me I couldn't have done a master's? I know I could have done one. I would, have needed, I would need a bit of guidance in how to write to the conventions, but then we all do when we join academia. Yes. So to me, that's not a big deal. So that's gonna be 
some of the admission criteria that we're going to include. That, that's so, why it's important. It was important to have this conversation. So that yeah. Know that they shouldn't just say, oh, well, I can't do what to do. For us, we want to create something that is qualitatively different. It's going to focus on us from the Caribbean, as well as our brothers and sisters from the continent. And we're going to balance it out with the other representations. Because what about, as I said, what about our Aboriginal brothers and sisters who see themselves as black? Yeah. You see some of the Aboriginal marches when they've got the Ghanaian um, flag with a black star in it. They might have Rastafari. They've got Garvey's red, black and green. You know, sometimes you'll see them, you'll see them fly the flag of... Um, uh, Congo, because it's red, gold, and green with a star in it. You know, you see this in Brazil. You see this with our indigenous African, um, indigenous First Nation peoples in the Americas, because they get it. It's one common enemy messed up this planet. And that doesn't mean all white people are implicated in equal positions. But what they cannot get away from is they did that. Because even with that erasure of, say, Raheem Sterling, yeah. it's just like my love of sci-fi. But when I was a child, I never saw myself represented in sci-fi until I started to, and I think until Eartha Kitt joined Batman. Yeah. And the reason why, if you think about it, and I've argued this for years, and other people have, when you write science fiction, you write about the future, the future world good, bad, or indifferent, but you will locate yourself and who you want to be represented in it. Yeah. So it's not coincidental that black people weren't really in sci-fi <laughs> because the people who wrote it didn't see us in it. Exactly, which is, which is my point. You've raised two very good points there um, with regard to your MA in that if people wanted to do like a five minutes or a film or something, that they would not be tied down and say, no, you've got to do a dissertation. No, no, and I'm going to factor that in. Because that's exactly what I face when I was do when I am doing the PhD. Yeah. And I don't want to just do a, a you, I want to create something and show it so that yeah. you can't tell me as a gatekeeper, you can't tell me that it can't be done because see it. Yeah. <laughs> of course it can, and it's visual yeah. sociology, they call it now. Right. You know, one of the, that's why when I say to people, you know, that my, my doctoral thesis was so unique, I just have to take my hat off to Prof Les back. Because it was totally unique. I didn't do the conventional literature review, methodology. Like mine was written as an A and a B side. The A side was the academic side. It's like you're playing an a, a, a side of a record. You can't do anything with it. The vocal is already set. Yeah. And then the B side was the street side. What we say about what they say about us. So I wrote as an A and a B side of a record. And interestingly, when myself and Les Back were sitting down and thinking about it, because I would say to Les, right, I'm using this, this sample from General Echo or, or Barrington Levy or Brigadier Jerry or Maccabee or whatever it was. And then Les said, you know what? We'll have to have a CD included in it. We're talking 2002. All right. So in my doctoral thesis, there's a CD in the back of it. Do you know what? I'm sure, yeah. Sometimes people think something like exaggerated. <laughs> so when you do yours, you make sure you don't go for the little mendicant PR, PR copy. You make sure you do yours like this. Oh, it costs a, costs a pretty penny, but let me tell you, there it is, from 2002. Okay, yes. Exactly. And as I said, I wrote it as an A-side and B-side, and at the back, there it is. <laughs> okay, hidden voice. So you know what happened? It's like this. It's got all the tracks on there. Yeah. And if they were reading it, it's like, right, General Echo, track three. So when you read it, you listen. Okay. Otherwise, then... you don't get the gist of the culture. Because we are, you know, what people do 
is they collapse us as Africans to oral traditions, which is wrong because the three oldest languages come out of Africa. And even the ancient Egyptians who people say hieroglyphs and blah, 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 they had two or three written languages for commerce. Hieroglyphs was spiritual upliftment. They convey a different message. Okay. But what they do is they try and collapse us. And these were some of the things I was bridging in that book because I'm saying, if you hear a lyric, it's like you yourself know. If somebody comes up to you, you've got your favorite song. If somebody comes up to you and just says the words to you, you might not even recognize it. If they sing it, it will trigger something. But if they play it, your re-memories as, um, is it Avery, oh God, and Avery Gordon says, your re-memories will kick in, like what come out of Beloved, the book. Yeah. And you will be in that place. That's right. That's what we're going to recreate on the MA. That, that is so accurate because sometimes you just hear like two two beats of a song. Yeah. Two beats and you're there. You say, oh, what? Yeah, or a smell. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, and the, so what I'm basically saying is this aspect of experiential learning yeah. is going to be at the forefront of this MA. And it's not going to be less rigorous because it's not going to be, oh, people can come in and do any look of PR and PR team. But what we're going to do is we're going to encourage people to recognize that when you come to the table, you've got something to lay on the table. Sorry. Forget about being in the constraints of these people's ways of knowing or being their little box. We're divergent. Th human beings are divergent thinkers. Well, everybody has something to bring to the table. Everybody Absolutely. Everybody. Absolutely. And that's one of the, and as I said, you know, People can go online and they can read the stuff. But as I said, anyone who's worked with me will have an idea of what's coming because I challenge people. I understand the theory. I, I, I am very well versed in classical social theory across disciplines like anthropology, sociology, cultural studies. I black studies, so-called African studies, you know, youth crime, youth justice, criminology. I am well versed in those. Right. But there are other things we can bring to the table. It's interesting you said that because in, in one of my chapters I'm talking about history and then I broke down it's just, just, when I looked up, you know, the 12 different branches of history but we're not mentioned in or the impact that each of those branches have. But I said no you have to have a there's another strand here which is the impact in black history, these other types, the economic and politi political mm -hmm. had on us as black people. And you've totally ignored that. Of course. Which I get. Yeah. But well, it's because we're peripheral. Yeah. But we, like, we, we need to be right in the middle of things. Which yeah, is we're peripheral. It's like, I remember when I was, when I was, when I was taught, let's say taught or introduced to Marxism, Okay, because when I was a youth, a lot of the stuff I read was written by Marxists like um, Rustan Resistance, Horace Campbell, um, Che Guevara, all the stuff we used to read when I, when I was younger. But when I got to university and I started to read about Marx, and I think it was it, I think it was a a paper by Stuart Hall that was like something about Karl Marx unfinished base and superstructure metaphor or something. And I'll be honest with you, I read it and it bamboozled the hell out of me. Because sometimes Stuart Hall is quite accessible or was quite accessible. And sometimes me don't know when did I say. You know, I have to be honest. But I remember when I read it in the first year of my degree, I read it and I thought, Jesus Christ, we're invisible. And then I thought, well, actually, as Africans, we're not invisible. What we are is parts of the forces of production. We're not in the relations of production. So we don't make bourgeoisie or proletariat or lump and proletariat because we were the equivalent of a horse, a donkey, a mule, or the wind. Commodity. We were commodities, but more, more importantly, we were parts of the forces of production, like the wind that turned windmills or we, when we used our power to do water wheels. So not just commodities. That's what we were doing. 
Yeah, forces. We were parts of the forces of production. And then I thought to myself, that is why it's never sat comfortably with me when people try and class me. Because right now I'm a professor. I'm a tenured chaired professor, which means I am what? Middle class, upper middle class. But if I go and decide to do a bit of plumbing tomorrow, I'm working class. But more importantly, I can't be working class or middle class. I have to be black working class or black middle class. And if you have to prefix your identity with something, then you're in trouble. Something, something, yeah. And, you know, it doesn't happen. You don't hear, this is a white professor. No, because they are the standard and they are the norm. Yeah, right. They're the measured. And you do touch, you, you are going to touch on that with white professors. Oh, we're going to touch on, if, if yeah. people look online, they'll see, you know, the categories we're going to touch yeah. on, like white privilege, African chaplain, slaveman, windrush. Yeah. You know, because even these conversations about the Windrush, they're acting like they popped out of a vacuum. I did a talk for wonderful sister, Dr. Velma McClyman. I'm sure that's her name, useless with names, last week on Woman's View. And we were talking about Windrush. So I actually chatted a bit of a lyric that I, I demoed in 1991. Mm -hmm. And it said, before my giant inner on the celebration, let me tell you about the Windrush generation. Just like the slaves on the plantation, the mules were for build up the wall of England. That's what they did. Yeah. I've never separated that it from was the that. Sole purpose. That's what I'm saying. We were commodities. And what bothers a lot of people now is we realize that the way they try and reduce us, demoralize us, and make us feel inferior inferior what is really the concern with them is when we get into their hallowed halls of academia and we start to reason with them and we're like what the hell you know it's like listening to the government these people are supposed to be the most intelligent representatives of oxbridge jesus christ most of them they're so damn thick it's ridiculous because they equate their their vocabulary or their accent or how they speak with intelligence. And that's the mistake that a lot of us make. Yes. I if them speak is sporky, are stush, we think they're intelligent. So we're back to the same thing again. What we have been taught is- how Absolutely. Our, you know. Absolutely. Why don't you speak properly? Absolutely. So 400 I'm years of right. programming yes. isn't going to go away overnight. But we have to start. And, and the thing is, they need to be challenged head on. I remember I was invited on this program called The Moral Maze on BBC Radio 4, Radio 4, which I would never go on again. Should be called The Immoral Maze. First time I've ever been on the BBC where what they brief you on is not what they question you on. And you have like seven and a half minutes and it had that, what's his name, Burke, you know, that famous BBC old dude. He was like the, 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 chair or whatever it was, I don't know whatever you want to call him, the lead person. And then you had Portillo, whose head is bigger than my garden shed. He frightened me, his head was that big. You think now, Joe, when I look around, I was like, kiss my mum, I've never seen a head that big. Anyway, him. And basically, when that Michael Burke asked me, like they asked me the question, and really the question was, can black people be racist? And I said to them, no, because we don't have an economic base. It, Only it, people who can subjugate other races economically can be racist. But it's about power. Because we don't have no power here, exactly. Power. Yes, right. this, is, this is it, you know. But... Yeah, and when I went in there, they, they flipped it and turned it into something else. And I remember, I'll never forget, when that Michael Burke asked me the question and I answered it, he went, oh, do you think you can say that again? Because I didn't quite understand. Well, at least he was honest. I know if I was white, he wouldn't have said that because what they try to do is they try to flummox you by making you so here he is at the time i was dr henry so here he is dr henry who does he think he is yeah. but the joke is sis me i set for them because i've been avoiding mainstream tv you know but the next time i go on one of those news programs watch what i go and do with them
Because yeah. I've got a little strategy that I'm going to do on them. You know and I'll expose them. And I won't be disrespectful. I won't be rude. There's just something I'm going to do. The first time I, I think I heard you speak, it was when you said that um, you know, I'm, a, I, I'm a trained plumber. You know, I'm very good at doing a plumber, but um, me being a plumber is not going to get me into places. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm a professor now, so I can get in. So absolutely so absolutely that's, that's why when you get your phd sis you're going to overstand the different doors that open because one of the ways they really confound and confuse us and most people know i'm not into honorary titles to me you earn it so i certainly are into mbes and cbes and all this kind of stuff to me that is no different from Jewish brothers and sisters accepting swastikas is no difference to me because they're the same people who dehumanized us, subjected us to the worst treatment meted out to members of the human family, reduced us to three fifths of a human being under the American Constitution, which resonated across wherever the hell we were. Mm. And then you're going to go and take titles from what MBE, OBE, CBE, and any other way they do it is doctorates. Yeah. So you've got Neville Lawrence, double honorary PhD, for what? They killed his you. Why would you want to be thingy? Doreen Lawrence, I have a lot of love and respect for her, but why would you want to be part of that system? It's a way of quieting you down. It's a way of keeping you quiet. Well, that's what Gramsci said about organic intellectuals. They come up a particular way and then they get compromised. Have you heard of this thing called the Black Boule? The black black boule. No. Well, because I just think it's important that we bring in these different narratives. Yeah. Otherwise, what's the point? Now is the time for it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I feel with time. No, I've said it anyway. You know, it's like what I said to people when they said to me, "Oh, this MA will never work." I said it. I got happen. Thank you. <laughs> because he said it. I got happen. Thank you. Thank you. That is exactly what people are telling me with, with the... Um, yeah, just like with the PhD, you've probably got people saying to you, oh, why are you... You just said to them, it's got happen. They, they keep... The, the television series, the 12 weeks, and they keep telling me, why don't you just do the script and we can mark the script? I said, no. Because yeah. <laughs> it's not what you want. <laughs> no. Exactly. 